Good evening, this is the Oscar Expert here, and it's time for a retrospective of the 2016 Oscars. You all know what happened. The season culminated in what was probably the most shocking and theatrical Oscar win of all time. We're gonna go through all the categories and what the race was looking like and all the other snubs and surprises that occurred. But of course, we gotta start with Moonlight vs. La La Land. But before we get into it, we got a fun sponsored ad for you. What's going on, buddy? I'm doing great, but I gotta tell you something serious. I'm one of thousands of Netflix users thinking about canceling my subscription. Those monthly prices are just too high and they're not offering enough good content for me. It's time to cancel. Here I go. Wait! What if I told you you could keep Netflix, have access to double the content, and pay a cheaper price for it? Fairy tales and fables, man. Next thing you know, the cat's gonna start talking. Cole's right. All you need is Surfshark VPN. What? You can talk? Yeah, I can, genius. Let me explain. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. It encrypts all the data sent between your device and the internet, keeping your data safe. I just connect to one of hundreds of servers all around the world, and in seconds, I'm protected. This tricks Netflix into thinking that you're in another location, so you can access streaming libraries all around the world. And I am not done talking! Netflix, like many subscription services, has different prices for different countries. So I can sign up for Netflix in a different location and get it for a cheaper price. Netflix might be cheaper, but with all the amazing things Surfshark has to offer, there's no way I'm gonna be saving money. <laughs> Actually, if you use our discount code, you can get 83% off, plus three months free, and you can cancel anytime within the first 30 days. This is like a dream come true. And just like a talking cat, the impossible is possible with Surfshark. With Surfshark. With Surfshark! <laughs> so the way the Oscar race was going that year, and I remember it all, I was into the Oscars very much at this point. After Toronto happened and La La Land premiered, it was just instantly like going to win Best Picture. It's probably one of the most Oscar-friendly Beatty movies Ever. It is a musical that loves old musicals that is about artists and dreamers living in LA trying to make it in the entertainment industry. The filmmaking is colorful and dazzling. It pays homage to all these other great Hollywood musicals like Singing in the Rain. So the old voters can get their nostalgia fix and think, why don't they make movies like this anymore? Except they're also making one right now and here it is in front of me. It was an original musical, which is just a total rarity. Most musicals were like Hairspray or Les Mis or Chicago, where you just take something that's on Broadway and you just turn it into a movie. And those movies are like, oh, you can go to Broadway in the theater seat or in your couch. And La La Land is like, no, this is what a movie musical is. And if we look at recent winners, I mean, The Artist won in 2011. That was totally worshipping old Hollywood films. Then Argo won the next year, which was also partly a movie about making a movie. And then Birdman wins in 2015, which is about, you know, pretentious actors. We all know that movies about movies movies and entertainers are Oscar bait. The Academy can relate to these movies. And the movie also feels fresh and modern. You know, it's not just uh, the artist level, like homage old movie worship. And it's also just like a great fucking movie. I mean, critics ate this up. Audiences loved this movie. It was a mega box office hit. Just a dazzling, emotional, exciting big screen experience. Every single musical sequence is catchy and beautiful. And it wasn't style over substance either. And with a director like Damien Giselle, he doesn't give you films that are just easy to decide what you think about the ending right after watching it. It becomes more real and relatable and people can take away different things and project their own experiences on it. And this movie resonated with a lot of people really deeply, not just for the aesthetics, but because there's a great story in the movie. And as far as what the movie represented, the movie is like this reaffirmation of the glory of Hollywood. Movies are alive and well. They're making us laugh and cry just the same as they did with Singing in the Rain. We're humming we're tapping our feet, we're having a time, we're smiling at the charming chemistry between the two leads. But despite La La Land's massive critical acclaim, there was one movie, only one, that had it beat that year with critics, and it was Moonlight. I remember this distinctly. Moonlight immediately had a 100 on Metacritic after its Telluride premiere. 
this movie wasn't really on the radar in terms of like being an Oscar thing. There was some buzz behind it. A24 was behind it. They just got their first Best Picture nominee the year prior with Room. But just on paper, like what about it is an awards player? I don't think it was even trying to be. La La Land is obviously a movie where the studio is like, okay, thanks for the script, Damien Giselle. We're going to get some Oscars with this movie. But Moonlight is a little indie with a $1.5 million budget about a gay black kid just trying to figure out where he belongs in the world, trying to find connection and love. Barry Jenkins made this movie with like people he went to college with and got them all nominated for Oscars. And it was the lowest grossing nominee of the bunch. Not really any household names in it. The director's past movie was Medicine for Melancholy, which was obviously an important step for Barry Jenkins getting to make this movie, but it was a $15,000 budget movie. It was nominated for some Indie Spirit Awards. It did decently for its budget, but it wasn't big enough to be exactly a breakout. So what was so special about this movie that once people saw it, they just were like, oh my God, Moonlight, oh my God, Moonlight. And now the movie has like best of the decade status, like literally, tops lists of the best of the decade. At face value, Moonlight is just exceptionally empathetic. It just brings us right into the world of this kid who's just struggling to find warmth in his life and in a world where his emotions are frequently abused. It's like a three chapter character study told in a very intense and poetic style. Barry Jenkins just loves his actors' faces. I think it's on another level in just the focus on the emotional depth of each moment. And you know, one of the best things about cinema in general is that it provides a window for us to look into other lives. And for many, this was a look into a life they were not familiar with. And for others, it was their lives finally being seen on screen. It examines identity, belonging, masculinity, and it's just a thoroughly beautiful movie. Now there's some context that I wanna get into when discussing this race. It actually took until 2009 for a movie that was even just directed by a black person to be nominated in Best Picture, and that was Precious. The second movie nominated by a black director was 12 Years a Slave, and of course that movie won. And then the year after that, Selma gets nominated. Still a surprisingly new trend, which is to say that the Academy does not have a great history of nominating movies like this and paying attention to movies by black people or just non-white people in general. In 2012, there was a Los Angeles Times study that found that the Academy was far less diverse than the movie going public. 94% white at this time, 94. 77% male, and black people were about 2% of the Academy, Latinos less than that. In the year 2014, there are no actors nominated who are not white. And so that's where the Oscars so white hashtag comes from. The next year, what do the Oscars do? It's all white people in the lineup again. And so the Oscars so white hashtag comes back more powerful than ever. That year, the movie Straight Outta Compton was it like somewhat in the conversation, not nominated. And the main criticism towards the Academy here was like, if you have a body that is just very, very white, they're gonna nominate movies that appeal to them. In 2016, it started to not feel good to just give Best Picture to the typical Oscar fair. The Academy was at a crossroads with who they want to be and what they want to represent with Oscar so white looming over them. And with the election of Trump, you know, it made a lot of people feel like things weren't just fun and games anymore. The election was clearly on voters' minds. I mean, you look at the entire ceremony, there was a clear anti-Trump theme to it. Jimmy Kimmel took jabs at him, calling him a racist. People were dedicating their awards to immigrants, victims of racial injustice, promoting messages of love and tolerance over fear. Gail Garcia Bernal spoke out against the wall, and then there was Oscar Ferrati's win. We'll get to his speech later on. Trump liked to appeal to his base by evoking vague nostalgia for the past. The slogan, Make America Great Again, left many non-white people asking, what time exactly are we worshiping here? And some were trying to draw a connection between this kind of nostalgia and La La Land's nostalgia. Like in the article, The Unbearable Whiteness of La La Land by Jeff Nelson. And I think it's worth noting that Jeff Nelson is fucking white. Now the article I think is pretty annoying and it's really unfair to paint a connection between these two kinds of nostalgia just because they're both nostalgia. But this wasn't the only article criticizing La La Land's whiteness. There was the jazz controversy where articles were claiming that the movie's trying to get the audience to be like, Ryan Gosling is the savior of jazz in this movie. It's not even that big a part of the movie. No one's leaving the theater thinking that Ryan Gosling saved jazz. As unfair as a lot of these pieces are, they they were pervasive at the time, and I do think that they were part of 
the awards conversation. And sure, every hyped up Oscar frontrunner gets their share of backlash. That's expected. La La Land definitely had its share of frontrunner fatigue too. I mean, it was such a hyped up movie that anybody who didn't love it was probably like, well, I don't get all the hype. I need to write an article about this proving to people that it's not as good as they think it is. But I do think that these articles may have gotten to people, this association between La La Land and whiteness. I mean, it is a very white movie, but like so are so many movies. It gets pegged on La La Land because it's the front runner. And it's also a movie that like politically doesn't really represent much. Going with a sort of escapism movie just didn't really feel great for voters at the time. And there was another movie that voters love that was right there, Moonlight. I think people were thinking a lot at this time about what movies represent culturally and politically. And the Very White Academy was more willing to pay attention to a movie like Moonlight than they normally would be. I am not trying to say that Moonlight won as a virtue signal vote. I think it won because voters loved the movie. They were tired of La La Land. I mean, we've already said it, but Moonlight was the most acclaimed movie of the year. People love the shit out of it. But amazing movies lose sometimes. I mean, look at Brokeback Mountain. That movie lost because the Academy wasn't ready for it. Many of the members were on the record saying that they didn't watch the movie, that they didn't care to see it. They were too homophobic. But in 2016, I think the Academy was more ready for Moonlight. They were ready to pivot from the typical Oscar bait fair and to go with an underdog, a movie that's kind of an outsider. It's not fantastical and feel good. It's raw and real. It's almost the antithesis of an Oscar bait movie. From who it's about, the setting it takes place in, the storytelling method, which is subtle and restrained and poetic. I mean, sure, it's emotionally heavy like Oscar bait films are. The cinematography and some of the technical elements are easily awards worthy and the performances are incredible. So it's not like the most left field thing they could have ever nominated, but as far as winners go, it was one of the most unconventional they've ever rewarded. I mean, this is a body known for awarding stuff like The King's Speech and Argo and Forrest Gump. And it was a fitting winner for a night where a lot of the speeches are about the power of film to evoke empathy and understanding and to look into the lives of the unheard. Again, to clarify, I'm not saying the Moonlight won for any other reason other than people wanted to vote for it the most and it moved them the most. But I do think it's important to acknowledge that there's always context to what moves people and why. And you may disagree that like the white La La Land articles had anything to do with it. Or maybe you think the political climate had no impact whatsoever. I don't know for sure if any of these things had an effect, but it feels like there might be connections there and I think they're worth exploring and mentioning. I think a lot of people kind of feel that Moonlight's win had to do with some context around it. I mean, art is always contextual. I think every Best Picture winner has a story about how the surroundings impacted that moment too. And since the Academy gave Best Picture to Moonlight, we've seen them go with underdogs a couple times, like with Parasite and with Coda. Even Nomadland is kind of an unconventional, not very Oscar-y movie that won Best Picture. I think we truly live in a time now that it feels like anything can win Best Picture if it has the right amount of passion behind it, whether or not it ticks off all those typical Oscar boxes. And maybe this year was the start of that, who knows? Now let's go back to the moment when La La Land wins, which is like one of the most shocking moments in like television history. At this point, the video may sound like it was a Moonlight versus La La Land race, but it really just felt like you're tuning in to see La La Land win. What was La La Land's track record with the precursors? Let's go over that right now. La La Land broke the Golden Globes record for most wins. It won seven Golden Globes, which was all of its nominations. At BAFTA, it won five awards out of 11 nominations, which was possibly a little weaker than some were expecting, but undeniably strong. It won eight Critics' Choice Awards out of 12 nominations. As we said, it won the People's Choice Award at TIFF. And La La Land, of course, had PGA and DGA wins. All this, and then it goes on to get 14 Oscar nominations. It ties the record. The record being held by Titanic and All About Eve, both those movies easily won Best Picture. Gold Derby had La La Land on track to win nine Oscars. The previous year, Spotlight won two, and movies weren't winning like a giant bunch of Oscars. People thought this was gonna be like a return 
to the classic Oscar sweep. And six wins is still kind of a sweep, but not when you don't win Best Picture. Some were predicting that it was gonna win 11 and tie with the most wins. I mean, after all, it tied for the most nominations, so why not? It seemed like it had a shot in categories like original screenplay, sound, editing, costumes. The only precursor that Moonlight did win was the Golden Globe because Moonlight was in drama, La La Land was in comedy, but it's obvious that if you match the two up in the same category, we, we know what would have won. It definitively felt like the second place prize there. Moonlight didn't win any BAFTAs, by the way. It had a WGA win in original screenplay, which was really good. Moonlight was adapted at the Oscars, but everybody else considered it an original screenplay because it was based off of an unproduced play. So we're talking Moonlight at the WGA beating La La Land and Manchester by the Sea in screenplay. I think that was probably like the best sign that Moonlight had. And also being an adapted was really good for Moonlight because that gave it a pretty easy opportunity to win that category at the Oscars. It was up against Lion and Arrival. Those movies weren't going to win screenplay. And once again, you know, if you have a shot at winning screenplay, you have a shot at winning picture. We, we saw that this year especially that supporting actor picture combo. Moonlight didn't even win SAG, and SAG is an award that has predicted some big upsets like Crash and Spotlight, Parasite, Coda. Hidden Figures won SAG. Hidden Figures beat Moonlight at SAG. Made no sense. Absolutely ridiculous. I was outraged because Moonlight has some of the best acting I've ever seen. I felt that way the second I saw it. It just did not seem like Moonlight was a potential threat to win if it couldn't even beat Hidden Figures at the SAG Award. So in terms of stats, Moonlight has very, very little in its favor, and then La La Land checks every single box. Even going into Best Picture, La La Land had six wins, including director and lead actress, so it wasn't looking like it was gonna lose. And then it didn't lose for a little bit. It won, and it was like, oh yeah, yep, everyone said goodnight. Farewell. I saw this win and I, I just went to bed and I was tired. And then, you know, brother bro calls me on my cell phone and I'm like, what is it, bitch? And he's like, Moonlight won best picture. I'm like, shut the fuck up. You're pulling a prank on me. I'm not gullible. My friends were screaming into the phone too. And I was like, thanks for all being in on a prank. And then he was like, you have to, you have to just listen to me. And so I exit and I see on the TV that in fact, the Moonlight crew is up there accepting Best Picture. I desperately wish that I had filmed my reaction. I mean, I have a reaction to La La Land winning, and it's me saying I'm going to bed. It's now well known, of course, that Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway read the Best Actress envelope, which said Emma Stone, La La Land. What happened is they carry two briefcases of each envelope, and they gave the backup actress briefcase instead of the Best Picture briefcase, and they got fired. And the reason the hosts didn't notice it, I think, I mean, Warren Beatty apparently noticed something was wrong and was like, uh, what are we doing about this, Faye Dunaway? And then she was like, La La Land. It says La La Land. That makes sense. She claims to not have like seen Emma Stone's name, but I think that were the winner of Best Actress like Isabelle Huppert or Natalie Portman, she wouldn't have been like, Best Picture goes to Elle. I think it was just easy for her to believe that of course it was La La Land. Like think about the perfect storm that is this moment. They could have read a Best Actor envelope and it would have been like Manchester by the Sea, what? They could have saw that it was the wrong envelope and given it back. But no, they accidentally get the envelope of the movie that everyone thinks is gonna win Best Picture. Then they let it win for two and a half minutes and then hectic shit happens on stage and we in fact find out that Moonlight really won. Just the theatrics of Moonlight being able to like take the Oscar from La La Land and knowing all that led up to this moment and knowing the expectations people had for this moment and how the mistake played into those expectations. It was as if they had staged it. It was like, how does a moment like this happen? And it's real. It's also so rare that we get a best picture race where there's not just like one villain and one movie that everybody wants to win. Both of these movies are genuinely some of the best of the decade. And many felt that Moonlight was robbed of its moment, and it kind of was. I mean, the movie is just very heavily associated with beating La La Land. Maybe it would have been no matter what. And to an extent, maybe the movie had more publicity because of the moment itself and how widely discussed it was. But the moment was not like a pure celebration of like, oh, the movie that won, won because we loved the movie and here you go. It was like, oh dude, Moonlight beat La La Land because there was a whole mess up with the Oscars and Warren Beatty was there and Jimmy Kimmel made a joke. And La La Land is like forever the movie that lost Best Picture in one of the most stunning, Oscar wins ever. So what else was nominated? 
because there were other movies at the Oscars this year. We have Manchester by the Sea, which is a really acclaimed movie out of Sundance. The one best actor, one original screenplay. You might imagine this is like the number three for best picture probably. Got a slew of above the line nominations, three acting nominations, and it was being praised for its authentic and grueling portrayal of grief and how it's caused somebody to withdraw from the world. It's not just about somebody like sobbing the whole movie. It's about how this has like made them a shell of a person. Kenneth Lonergan finally got his Oscar moment after being a celebrated screenwriter and playwright for years. Then there's Arrival, which got eight nominations. Should have gotten 11, but we'll get to those. This was Denny Villeneuve's first all around Oscar contender. Don't know why it wasn't Sicario. This is one of my personal favorite movies ever. It is just beautiful beautiful to look at and listen to. The ending just totally blows my mind. I remember being really nervous this movie was going to underperform. Probably because the Golden Globes triggered me. They only gave this two nominations, actress and score, which didn't even get at the Oscars. Had a November release date, Venice premiere, box office hit. There was Hacksaw Ridge, which was Mel Gibson's return to film for the first time in 10 years. Kind of rare to get a movie that is like explicitly kind of Christian in its values, but also universal. Like it wasn't a movie where you couldn't enjoy it if you were not Christian. It's about like a human church mouse who's like, I, I, I'm going to not shoot anybody in the war. And they're like, you can't do that. This is a hard world. You need to get tough. And he's like, I, I, I'm going to stick true to my values and what, what I believe. The story is just classic Oscar bait. I mean, I guess it was undeniable. There's nothing really wrong with that. It wasn't my favorite nominee. It starts out like cheesy in a 90s way, like a sunny inspirational tale. And then it turns full like blood and guts and people's arms getting like fucking torn off. As much as this movie has like an anti-violence message, it really fucking loves the explosions. It took a long time for people to actually acknowledge that this was getting nominated because a lot of people thought they wouldn't embrace Mel Gibson. Despite it coming out in November, Gold Derby did not think it was getting nominated until December. I think this was because the reviews weren't like through the roof raves and they just had to kind of wait a while and realize, oh, audiences are not letting go of this movie. Lion was big time Oscar tearjerker bait. Another one that had good critic reviews, but was nominated more as a crowd pleaser. I like Lion quite a bit. I think it earns all the tears. It's really well acted, just gorgeously shot, great score. And if the ending of this one doesn't do anything for you, then I just don't have to tell you. But early in the year, I remember being like, what is Lion? Who the fuck is Garth Davis? But it was the Weinstein Company. And that should have given me maybe some faith that it was an awards movie. At Toronto, it came in second place for the People's Choice Award. At that point, it was like, okay, this is an Oscar movie. There's also the last Weinstein Company to ever be nominated. Then there was Hidden Figures, another big time Oscar bait film, told the true story of unsung heroes, the black women who really got that ship to the moon. It's a really wonderful story. There's nothing too special about the craft or the visuals here. Just a really good crowd pleaser. It actually came out on Christmas with no festival run. I remember it being the one that sneaks into the race at the last minute that you're not even seeing when you're focused on all the fall festival premieres in October and November. In fact, the early precursors showed that this movie didn't really arrive until later. It was not nominated in the AFI top 10, not nominated for Critics' Choice, didn't get Golden Globe drama, although it got a couple other nominations. It was only PGA and SAG that it got when we said, okay, this is a latecomer contender. And it was really starting to kill it at the box office. It got a nice A plus cinema score. And once it was established in the race, it kind of rocketed up there. And the SAG ensemble win over Moonlight showed that maybe it was like a top five contender at the end of the day. It was actually number three on Gold Derby in terms of what people were predicting to win, even though it didn't even enter the top 10 to be nominated until right before the nominations. Heller Highwater was a pretty strange contender. It came out in August and it didn't really seem like it wanted awards. The poster looked like some random like crime action western thing that goes straight to like dvd but it was the director of startup which is a really good film and it was written by taylor sheridan who did sicario and it turns out the movie's really good and critics loved it it's a great neo-western crime drama a little bit of economic commentary in there too and it was thrilling enough where audiences were also on board but after the movie's release, it was like, okay, maybe Jeff Bridges gets nominated, maybe screenplay. And then after the critics group start nominating it really heavily, people get on board with the fact that it's actually gonna get nominated for best picture. And finally there was Fences, which was Denzel Washington directing an adaptation of August Wilson's most renowned play. Denzel Washington and Viola Davis played these roles on Broadway and both won Tonys for them. So the narrative for them being like, 
acting front runners was there just from the get-go. People thought this was getting nominated. And ever since Viola Davis was confirmed to be supporting, we knew she was winning, even though this movie didn't really come out until December. It was pretty straightforward in terms of its presentation and visuals. Nothing really to write home about there. But the acting was great and the source material was great. I wouldn't imagine it had too many number one votes. I think this was probably like a number nine. I think this was a great lineup overall. I mean, you've got like three masterpieces in here at least. As far as what the Golden Globes did, people were surprised at the time that Hell or High Water and Lion got nominated because people really thought like Fences and Arrival and even Silence were gonna be nominated at this time. This was a year where I think it took people a long time to figure out what was actually going on. So what were the fallen contenders, the would-have-beens, and what was maybe the number 10 slot if there was one? Loving and Jackie were both contenders that had nice buzzy fall festival premieres, they had baity subject matter, good reviews, but it took a long time for people to understand that they were not in fact locks. I remember when Loving premiered thinking, okay, this has like good reviews, but are people crazy about it? And I'm actually, you know, proud to say that I'm on the record not predicting Loving after seeing the reviews. Meanwhile, it was like number six on Gold Derby for like a couple months. It was trying to be profound in its simplicity, but I think a lot of people just found it to be a little mild. And Jackie, you know, very much like Spencer, really strong movie technically, has a great lead performance that you just have to nominate. But little did we know that audiences would just think it was like a total weirdo movie. Very strange, not your typical biopic kind of thing. Took people a while to realize that it wasn't actually getting nominated. And then there was Silence, oh my God. The Scorsese movie that went wrong. I mean, it didn't really go wrong. Like Silence was really good, but the fact that this was like a period epic from Scorsese with a stacked cast and it didn't get nominated is like nuts. And this movie did not even premiere until like nominations were starting to happen, until like Critics' Choice and Golden Globes were already going ahead. So people thought this was getting nominated the whole year. We were like, where is Silence? What's happening with Silence? It made the AFI top 10, but then the Critics' Choice happened and it's nowhere to be seen. So we're like, oh my God, did they not see it? Like what's happening here? Where are you Scorsese? Like you gotta show your movie. We need you to come out and show your movie. Then the reviews came out and they were good. So we were like, okay, I mean, he's done plenty of movies that were getting this level of acclaim that still got a lot of Oscar nominations. And then Golden Globes happened shortly after these reviews dropped. And we were like, okay, where is silence? How did the Golden Globes not nominate Marty? And you slowly find out that people kind of found it a little slower than other Scorsese films. You can look at the audience ratings, not as high as some other stuff that he's done recently. Didn't get any BAFTA nominations. Wasn't at PGA, wasn't at DGA. It really was not until the ASC, the American Society of Cinematographers nominations that it showed up anywhere and then only got that one nomination. And then there was Nocturnal Animals, which didn't really feel like an awards film, maybe outside of, you know, being well-crafted, well-acted, but as like a sort of thriller, mystery-ish movie, it just didn't feel like the Oscars thing. And yet, there were some little scares that we had about this movie maybe getting in. This movie got like a handful of Golden Globe nominations and Critics' Choice nominations. I mean, the Golden Globe ones were really surprising. I mean, screenplay director and supporting actor those were all shocks. The reason that it got so many Golden Globe nominations is probably in part because Tom Ford gave Golden Globes voters two $90 cologne bottles each. As we said, the Golden Globes, very small, very easy to bribe. The HFPA had established a $95 limit on gifts, so everybody had to give one of their cologne bottles back. So uh, why did Tom Ford get a screenplay and a director nomination at the Golden Globes? I mean, who, who really knows? Who really knows the mystery? I don't know what happened at BAFTA though, because this movie got a fuck boat of nominations. It got nine, and yet somehow still missed Best Picture. Actor, director, editing, everything. So at the end of the day, we're like, how is this movie gonna perform at the Oscars? Like, is it gonna get only screenplay? Is Aaron Taylor Johnson gonna get in? Like, and then at the end of the day, gets one nomination and it's none of the ones that BAFTA gave. Sully was a bit of a question mark for a while. It was better than expected, but not anything like extraordinary. Captain Fantastic, that got an ensemble nomination at SAG, which was a huge, 
huge shock. That movie came out in July, wasn't expecting anything from it. Maybe it was somewhat close for Best Picture, I'm not sure. Deadpool got a PGA nomination, but like it wasn't actually close. That's just what the PGA likes to do. I, Daniel Blake got nominated for Best Picture at BAFTA. It's a British movie won the palm. That was pretty much just like a, a BAFTA's thing. And I also want to mention Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk because that was just like one of the biggest awards flops that I can remember. You got Ang Lee directing a war film shortly after doing Life of Pi. This thing is announced to be 120 frames per second using new FPS technology because everybody in the future of cinema is gonna watch things at a thousand frames per second. There's gonna be no motion blur. It's gonna be nothing like your eyes see. All this high frame rate nonsense was going on with like The Hobbit and James Cameron was saying he's gonna do it with the Avatar movies. I'm pretty sure he's not. I unfortunately never got to see this in 120 frames per second. Maybe I missed that opportunity, but basically this movie got mediocre reviews and just died. But on Gold Derby, this thing was like in the top three the whole year until they got those reviews. Steve Martin was like number one for supporting actor. So what was number 10? I have no clue. Was it Loving or Jackie? Was it somehow silence? Was it nocturnal animals? I really, I really cannot say. In Best Director, Damien Chazelle at a clean sweep. This was thought to be even more likely than Best Picture, even though both were thought to be nearly locked in. Barry Jenkins was nominated. Obviously, that's great. Denis Villeneuve was nominated. That's fantastic. He didn't even get nominated for Dune, so at least he has this. This was a shock with Mel Gibson's inclusion. He did get a Critics Choice and Golden Globe nomination, but he didn't get DGA or BAFTA. And Mel Gibson had been gone from the spotlight for a long time. Some people viewed this as like, welcome back, Mel, you got sobered up. You're here, you're making a great movie. Good job, buddy. And then people were like, wait, are we forgetting that like Mel Gibson has a history of domestic abuse and going on anti-Semitic and racist and sexist rants. So there was a lot of controversy around all of that, and yet he did get nominated. Garth Davis was pretty close for Lion. He got the DGA nomination. That feels kind of like the uh, Taika Waititi getting just DGA for Jojo Rabbit. Tom Ford, as we know, got Golden Globe and BAFTA. Denzel Washington, people thought he was happening in the beginning of the year, but ultimately the movie didn't have like enough visual craziness going on to get him in there. Best Actor, Casey Affleck, Manchester by the Sea. Many consider this to be like the best lead actor winner of last decade. And although he had Critics Choice and Golden Globe and BAFTA to his name, people didn't know he was actually going to win it. He lost the SAG award to Denzel Washington for Fences and people thought, oh my God, is there a tide turn? Part of what was going on here was Casey Affleck had some sexual harassment allegations and allegations that on certain movie sets, he was letting these kind of things happen. He later even, kind of admitted that he regretted some behavior. So it's not like this was entirely made up as some people would probably try to say. Even so, many would still admit that just based on the performance alone, based on the merit of the performance, that he did deserve it. He was getting a lot of praise for his portrayal of grief. I thought he was great in the movie. I thought the performance deserved the Oscar. Also, Denzel Washington not nominated for BAFTA. We know that he's never been nominated there, but it's just like insane. It's insane that they won't nominate him. Ryan Gosling for La La Land won the Comedy Golden Globe nominated everywhere. In fact, everybody except for Denzel Washington at BAFTA was nominated everywhere. This was sort of a mysterious race too, because Andrew Garfield was like, oh, he's getting it everywhere? I thought he was better in silence, but obviously he's gonna get nominated for the best picture one. Viggo Mortensen in Captain Fantastic, that was the one that came out and was really surprising that he was just getting nominated everywhere, because that movie, again, came out in July, didn't seem like it was trying for awards. And then at the end of the year, people are like, oh my God, are they gonna nominate? you know, Joel Edgerton? Are people gonna nominate Tom Hanks for Sully? And then it just keeps being Vigo, like all the way. He just keeps getting nominated. Joel Edgerton for Loving was possibly a number six. He got Critics' Choice and Golden Globe. Tom Hanks for Sully got just Critics' Choice. And Jake Gyllenhaal for Nocturnal Animals got BAFTA. That's a pretty good nom right there. Jake Gyllenhaal's great in that movie. Best Actress was Emma Stone for La La Land. People knew she was winning pretty easily. I don't care what anyone has to say. I think Emma Stone totally deserved this win. And yes, Natalie Portman and Isabelle Huppert were great, but I think Emma Stone deserved the Oscar here. She just brought so much flavor and personality to this role. I definitely felt the ups and downs of her emotional journey throughout the entire movie. What more do you want from her performance? Natalie Portman put up somewhat of a fight for Jackie, I guess. She took the critic's choice. But once Emma Stone took like SAG, 
it was over. And Isabel Huppert took the Golden Globe. This was really a moment for Isabel Huppert because she'd never been embraced by the Academy, but she had garnered so much industry respect over the years. Everybody was really ready to just nominate her this year. And she ended up getting nominated everywhere, even though it was a French language performance. Meryl Streep for Florence Foster Jenkins got SAG and BAFTA. Very Beatty performance from her. The movie came out a little bit early, so I was kind of like, is this gonna be nominated? But it was just like, okay. Meryl Streep, like she acted her ass off and she, she gets another nomination, that's how it works. And then the big ass surprise, Ruth Nega in Loving only got Critics' Choice. I mean, that movie got Best Picture at the Critics' Choice, but by the end of the day, it looked like it was probably gonna get like no Oscar nominations, maybe an outside shot for an acting or screenplay. So for her to come back into the conversation, get nominated, her first nomination, I mean, it was really something. And it was also something because of who did not get this nomination? Meryl Streep. No! 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 How the fuck do they not nominate Amy Adams for Arrival? This was ridiculous. I couldn't believe that they did this. And you nominate the movie in eight other categories. She gets nominated everywhere. She's never had more acclaim than this performance. She carries the movie and she doesn't even get nominated. What the hell happened here? They also could have nominated Annette Bening for 20th Century Women, who I think was above Ruth Nega at the time on Gold Derby. Emily Blunt for The Girl on This Train. That movie was just considered like a flop. People were like, nope. That movie is nothing. It's not getting anything. And then she gets SAG. And we're like, okay, sure, maybe SAG, fine. And then she gets BAFTA. It's like, what, what the hell's going on here? Is this real? Taraji P. Henson gets like nothing, nothing. Even though her movie was so big. I feel like she should have gotten maybe the Golden Globe or something here. Supporting actor Mahershala Ali for Moonlight. Everyone knew this was coming on Oscar night. This is an amazing performance, but it's pretty short on screen time considering the character is only around in the beginning of the movie. And honestly, I mean, Moonlight is so well acted. You could have nominated like Andre Holland or Trevante Rhodes or any of the Chirones really. And they would have all been deserving nominees, but the hype sort of concentrated on Mahershala Ali. I can see why. I mean, he was like the eldest out of all the acting contenders for this movie. And he has a couple iconic scenes in the movie, the one in the ocean and the one where he reveals to Chiron that his mother is like a drug dealer, which is just such a heartbreaking scene. And he nails that moment, loses Golden Globe to not any of the other nominees, but to Aaron Taylor Johnson for Nocturnal Animals. What the hell? What the fuck? What the fuck? Look, who's the Academy Award? Look at who's the Academy Award? Look, who's the Academy Award? What the shit? What the shit? What the fuck is going on? Did they put his face on the bottle of cologne? I was slapping my couch when the Golden Globes announced that Aaron Taylor Johnson fucking won this award. And I think he's good in the movie, but I was not ready for him to beat Mahershala Ali. And it was sort of weird trying to figure out if he was gonna get nominated for the Oscar. Cause Michael Shannon earlier in the year seemed like he was getting all the buzz. He got the Critics' Choice nomination and he was being heavily nominated at Critics Groups. And in my opinion, Michael Shannon was freaking excellent in Nocturnal Animals and he needed the nomination. Aaron Taylor Johnson was great, but I think Michael Shannon needed it. And so his thunder was kind of seemingly stolen by Aaron Taylor Johnson for a while. And then Michael Shannon comes back and it's him and it's not Aaron Taylor Johnson. And then not only that, but he's the only nomination for the entire movie. That was great. I was very glad that the Oscars pulled through for Michael Shannon. Dev Patel in Lion was nominated everywhere. Dev Patel is fantastic in this movie. And this was a role where he got to show people that he wasn't just like a one hit wonder from Slumdog Millionaire. And he's still proving that. And he actually won the BAFTA over Mahershala Ali. Jeff Bridges for Hell or High Water was nominated everywhere. Ben Foster was also really great in that movie and he would have also deserved a nomination. Lucas Hedges in Manchester by the Sea, this is a great nomination too. I still think this is probably the best Lucas Hedges has ever been. He just completely breaks your heart in a couple scenes in this movie. And I was really glad that he actually got in because he was a little like iffy, missing BAFTA and Golden Globe even when Casey Affleck and Michelle Williams were stable everywhere. And who was expected to get nominated but didn't was really Hugh Grant for Florence Foster Jenkins, who got the Golden Globe Comedy Actor nomination 
SAG, and BAFTA. And then Simon Helberg gets a random ass Golden Globe nomination for Florence Foster Jenkins. And I was literally, I, I didn't see the movie and I was like, who in what? Like I'd never even heard of this performance. I didn't know that he existed in this movie. I had no fucking clue what was happening. Supporting actress, as I said, once they announced that Viola Davis was supporting, it was like, oh, they just gave Viola Davis an Oscar. We saw how much snot came out of her nose in the trailer. We all knew it was happening. She's got a lot of screen time for a supporting performance. It was just like one of the biggest no-brainers. How many supporting actress winners could go up against Viola Davis and win? Probably not many. And she, of course, swept everywhere. Michelle Williams, Manchester by the Sea, nominated everywhere. A great example of a performance that's light on screen time, but really, really impactful. Naomi Harris in Moonlight, that's a great nomination. Nicole Kibben in Lion also nominated everywhere. She was really good in that movie. That was just one of those things where they were like, we're gonna cast Nicole Kidman in this role so that she can get nominated. Like they probably knew it the whole time. And finally, Octavia Spencer in Hidden Figures. I remember there being this weird confusion of who's getting nominated for that movie. Is it Janelle Monet? Is it Octavia Spencer? Because the critics choice were like, oh, Janelle Monet. And it was like, oh, huh, interesting. But then I saw the movie and I was like, it seems like it's Octavia Spencer. Greta Gerwig was Critics' Choice nominated for 20th Century Women. But you know, this top five at the end of the day was really easy and obvious. Original screenplay, this went to Manchester by the Sea. I think this is a pretty great win. I mean, the writing in this movie was really what everybody was focused on. The ways in which it quietly explores what these characters are going through, the way that it inserts little bits of dark humor. Take the Casey Affleck, Michelle Williams scene, that the one that you know which one I'm talking about. There are parts of this scene where they're barely even forming coherent sentences, but you know exactly what's going on. You see her like reaching out to him, you see him pulling away, and you see how painful that is for each other to watch each other do that. The dialogue reveals that all this is happening without telling us that it is. And it won Critics' Choice in BAFTA. La La Land won the Critics' Choice as well. It was a a nice old tie there. And it won the Golden Globe for screenplay. So kind of looks like a two-horser here. Moonlight won the Writers Guild Award, as we've said, because it was considered original. Again, big achievement that that beat both those movies at WGA. It might have won the Oscar if it was an original, considering that it won Best Picture. We got Hell or High Water, which was nominated everywhere. That's a really great script. Taylor Sheridan was like the new talk of the town. I actually remember reading a lot of spec scripts when I was doing an internship. And a lot of them were like trying to be Taylor Sheridan. The Lobster only got Critics' Choice, but was like very widely expected to get the Oscar nomination. What is the original screenplay category for, but to give The Lobster a nomination? 20th Century Women, the surprise nominee here, not even a Critics' Choice nomination for this one. But Mike Mills, excellent writer. This was great that this actually happened. This was another movie that, you know, you kind of expect them to ignore. Adapted screenplay, Moonlight won. We talked about how this was kind of a cakewalk considering the competition here and that WGA win. Arrival won the Critics' Choice and WGA for adapted screenplay, so that might have been the runner up. But really, if Moonlight wasn't here, Lion might have won. Lion won the BAFTA. Hidden Figures ended up getting nominated pretty much everywhere. Even Critics' Choice, which is kind of interesting because it didn't get nominated for picture there. Fences was like a pretty easy one there. Nocturnal Animals, nominated everywhere. Nothing else can even say that except for Moonlight and didn't get the Oscar nomination. How did this happen? At the end of the day, the others were Best Picture nominees. Loving may have gotten kind of close. It got WGA Critics' Choice. Loving was also a movie that was confused about whether or not it was original or adapted. Hacksaw Ridge was the only Best Picture nominee that didn't get screenplay. Cinematography, La La Land wins. That was a really obvious one. Long takes, lots of colors, lots of colors. It does all kinds of crazy shit. Moonlight, beautiful looking movie. Very glad that this got nominated pretty much everywhere. But the ba BAFTA, BAFTA, what's going on? Lion wins ASC. This was a shock. I remember this being a shock. I remember being like, how did Lion win the ASC? Not that Lion isn't an amazing looking movie too. This is Greg Frazier we're talking about. Arrival, nominated everywhere. Thank goodness. Bradford Young was the first black person ever nominated in cinematography. I don't know where he's been, but this is among like the, the, the most beautifully shot movies I've seen in the past decade. And then Silence. What a lineup. 
No complaints here. Nocturnal Animals may have come somewhat close. Critics Choice and BAFTA. Jackie. You could have put Jackie in there too, and it still would have been an all-timer lineup. Editing Hacksaw Ridge wins. Sort of a surprise. It won BAFTA, but didn't really start winning that award anywhere else. What we should know is that BAFTA and the Oscar, they love to go for the most editing. The ACE, which went for Arrival, they are editors and they don't care whether or not it's showy. They know what's going on. I mean, if you just look at the scene where they're approaching the ship alone and how that suspense is built, that's just a masterclass in editing right there. But it was La Land that won Critics' Choice and was expected to take the award, I think, on Gold Derby. La Land has some scenes that have a lot of editing, but there are, you know, there are a lot of long takes. It wasn't really the most edited movie, was it? Hacksaw Ridge was the most edited movie. Moonlight, flawlessly edited movie. And Hell or High Water, I think it was like this and Manchester by the Sea were like five and six, and it was like, which one's gonna get it? People thought it was probably gonna be Manchester just because it was a bigger contender overall. Production design was La La Land, this was a no-brainer. One Critics' Choice and Art Directors Guild did not win BAFTA, Fantastic Beasts won BAFTA. La La Land was the first production design winner that takes place in the present day since Batman in 1989. But Batman was kind of a fantasy movie. So if you say no fantasy movies allowed, then you'd have to go back to all that jazz in 1979, also a musical, to get another winner from the present day. Arrival, like you had to, like, oh my God, the inside of the ship. Hail Caesar was the Coen Brothers movie released much earlier in the year. Meh, Coen Brothers, like not, not a bad movie, but not great. When you make a movie that takes place in Hollywood, you get nominated, even if you're Hail Caesar. And then the surprise here, the big surprise, Passengers. This movie was a huge flop, critically. People thought this movie was just long gone. And then it pops up in two categories on Oscar nomination morning, and it's just funny to me. I don't think it's even necessarily bad. I didn't see the movie, but when you look at images of the ship, I mean, these are some like big ass sets, very stylishly designed. I actually like when the Oscars nominate movies that are very outside the conversation, just because of like the merit of that one element. On the outside, you know, Jackie, in hindsight, you know, that just really seems like a costumes and not production design thing. Hidden Figures seems like maybe it got close. It actually won the Art Directors Guild for period. Doctor Strange was BAFTA nominated in production design, kind of weird. And when you think about it, it's kind of like weird that Hacksaw Ridge didn't get more hype here. Costume design, here's a real surprise for you. You got a race where it looks like it's La La Land versus Jackie. You know, Jackie wins BAFTA and Critics' Choice, and then La La Land, it's like the front runner and it's gonna win production design and there's lots of colorful costumes. And then Fantastic Beasts, like leapfrog fucks over both of these movies. Didn't win jack shit, and I just remember being just shocked and on the floor. I think what happened here, ultimately, is which one had the most costumes. And the costumes are kind of cool in the way in which they reflect the time period, but also through like a fantasy Harry Potter lens. Fantastic Beasts won an Oscar, and the entire Harry Potter franchise never got one. The other lesson here might just be to not underestimate Colleen Atwood. And then you had Florence Foster Jenkins nominated and Allied nominated. This was the lone nomination for Allied, which was kind of this like Robert Zemeckis, Brad Pitt, Marion Cotillard, weird flop movie. In best score, La La Land won and it swept. If you were against La La Land this year, I'm so sorry. How could you deny all those melodies that still randomly slip into your head to this day? Moonlight, more amazing this there. Lion, fantastic stuff. Also BAFTA, where were you? Where were you with Moonlight score? Jackie gets nominated, which is very exciting because they nominate Mika Levi, who the Academy completely overlooked for Under the Skin, only a few years before Passengers gets in. This is probably like because it's Thomas Newman that it gets in. This is like kind of a major category and this movie I thought was just completely dead and nobody cared. And then Arrival is just not eligible. Like, are you kidding me guys? And it's because they use Max Richter in the beginning and the end and they think voters are gonna be stupid and they're gonna think that it's part of the score. If you told them that, they'd still vote for it because the rest of it's so good. Johan Johansson robbed of a nomination. This score is one of his all-timers. The sound categories were pretty goddamn confusing. So in mixing, La La Land was thought to win because it's a musical. People thought this is just how it goes. 
Now, I guess it makes sense that Hacksaw Ridge wins a sound award, right? But we thought it was gonna maybe have a better shot at sound editing, okay? That's what we thought, because it's a war movie and that's how it goes. And American Sniper just happened, where American Sniper took editing and Whiplash, the Chazelle music movie, takes mixing. That outcome looked like it made more sense, but no, Hacksaw Ridge takes mixing. Possibly a little bit because the Academy doesn't know their difference. Arrival wins the BAFTA for sound. It wins just the sound award at BAFTA. They don't have two separate categories. They did a great job picking Arrival for sound. Are you kidding me? Arrival sound is insane. Rogue One is nominated here and 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. Michael Bay movie is nominated here as well. Moonlight should have gotten a sound nomination, by the way. Sound editing. This was like, okay, this is gonna be Hacksaw Ridge, and maybe if the voters are really confused, it'll be La Land. And it was a rival, it was a rival, it was a rival, and an arrival became an Oscar winning movie when it was expected to go home empty handed. You know, the real sound editing in Arrival is like the aliens speak. I mean, in my opinion, I feel like I would have been more likely to award this for sound mixing. Again, I don't think they knew the difference that well, but I will definitely take it. Hacksaw Ridge, La Land both nominated. Also, La Land being nominated is the product of category confusion. When they were playing examples of the sound editing from each movie, they played like the beeping of horns in the beginning. Like it didn't have a lot of sound creation. It's more dealing with music and stuff like that. Deepwater Horizon and Sully get sound editing. In visual effects, The Jungle Book swept everywhere. This movie is I think like 97% visual effects. It's like one live action kid away from being a completely CGI animated movie. And it was a pretty astonishing creation visually at least. And the rest of the contenders, you know, there was not really one that stood out above the rest. I mean, Doctor Strange, you know, you have all the psychedelic stuff in there too. Rogue One Star Wars movie. Deepwater Horizon, which won the Supporting Visual Effects Award at VES. And then here's a, a very inspired nomination. Kubo in the Two Strings in Visual Effects, an animated stop motion film. This is actually not the first time this has happened for a stop motion film. The Nightmare Before Christmas was nominated for visual effects. But it was really cool that Kubo could still get the nomination in 2016 when visual effects movies are everywhere. What they did in Kubo is they used a lot of green screen and created like some beautiful looking skies and backdrops and incorporated visual effects in other ways into the stop motion animation. Unfortunately, Arrival wasn't nominated. This was pretty shocking. Like, why wouldn't you nominate Arrival for visual effects? It didn't have like the most of them, but Ex Machina like just one visual effect. So it was like, okay, you guys are embracing stuff where it's not like visual effects the whole movie. I don't know why I didn't get it. Really doesn't make sense. Fantastic Beasts got nominated pretty much everywhere and still missed out. Makeup and Hair, The Suicide Squad wins. Now, a lot of people shit on the Oscars for this because they're like, LOL, you gave Suicide Squad an Oscar. But like, on the makeup alone, can we disagree? Honestly, not really. I mean, sure, Joker's look is like kind of cringe, but still like they gave all these characters some really unique and interesting looks. All the tattoos and shit, they have one character who's like a weird creature guy, reptile. Star Trek Beyond was nominated. People thought that was gonna win because they were in disbelief that Suicide Squad would win. And then A Man Called Ove was nominated. That was an international film. After Suicide Squad won, there were all these memes going around like, you just gave a DC movie an Oscar and a Marvel movie has never won an Oscar. That was fun. People thought Florence Foster Jenkins and Deadpool were gonna get nominated. Deadpool especially really made sense because they did have like prosthetic burn shit. And then Jackie won Critics Choice but wasn't nominated. Song was easily City of Stars. This was like, you know, as no brainer as Skyfall winning or Shallow winning or Let It Go. This is just one of those things. Moana Song nominated, Audition from La La Land the second song nomination here. They could have filled up the whole category here with La La Land songs. Can't Stop the Feeling from Trolls. I mean, they just couldn't resist the uh, the catchy little pop song that year. And you have this song that I haven't heard from the Jim James, the Jim, the Jim the James Foley story. And this is nominated because it was Sting who did the song. No love for Drive It Like You Stole It from Sing Street. How could you? Why did you? 
Even the Golden Globes who nominated this movie for comedy musical didn't nominate the song. Absolutely ridiculous. Why, why are you doing this? Animated with Zootopia. Really good film. Came out at the beginning of that year. This is a really good lineup overall. Kubo and the Two Strings won the BAFTA and that was a very impressive stop motion animated film. One of the most beautiful looking stop motion films and possibly Leica's crowning achievement, at least visually. But of course you're not beating Disney in this category, so sorry. Moana nominated everywhere in another year. That feels like that could have won. And then you have The Red Turtle and My Life is a Zucchini. You got your two international picks because this is when the category was determined by just the animation branch and you used to get like two international films nominated in this category in like the same year. I haven't seen The Red Turtle, but My Life is a Zucchini is very good. Finding Dory. Left out. So sorry, Dory. You just weren't as good as Finding Nemo and you weren't even really that close. Good on the Oscars for nominating some international films instead. Documentary feature. OJ Made in America wins. Now there's a lot to say about this one because it's not a movie, it's a mini series, and it was always intended to play on TV, and it's the first TV series and the only TV series ever to win an Oscar. I repeat, a TV series won an Oscar in this category this year, and then they made rules to ensure that it never happens again. I really don't care because this is such a good documentary. It's an incredible retrospective on the OJ trial and the political climate at the time. It's the longest movie to win this Oscar, it is almost eight hours, and it qualified because the studio gave it a limited theatrical run in New York and LA, and so it was submitted and it won, and now you're not allowed to do that. And it made a big splash when it came out. It was one of those that everyone was talking about. A lot of like classic, iconic documentaries in this category. 13th, Ava DuVernay, who just did Selma, does a documentary about how fucked the US prison system is and how it incarcerates people who are black and Latino at insane, unjustifiable rates. This documentary is like really well known. Like a lot of people have seen this documentary. And I Am Not Your Negro is the third movie in this category that deconstructs like race in America. It centers around the works of James Baldwin. It was considered one of the best movies of the year, period. And then the other nominees are Life Animated and Fire at Sea. And then finally, International feature. Now the salesman, people didn't know if that was going to win or if it was going to be Tony Erdman. Tony Erdman won The Palm Door and was one of the most acclaimed movies of the year, high 90s on Metacritic. I think the salesman may have won anyway, but there was like a secondary reason that people had to vote for the salesman. And it was because of Trump's travel ban. People knew that a vote for the salesman was a vote for a speech from Farhadi, probably regarding the travel ban that Trump executive ordered on Muslim majority countries like Iran. This ban was in effect while this voting happened and while the win happened. And it was explicitly in order to prevent Muslim people from coming to the US. Farhadi was not there in protest and had somebody read on his behalf, a speech that he wrote speaking out against the Muslim ban. And it was his second Oscar after a separation. Other nominees were Land of Mine, A Man Called Ove, and Tana. Now what the hell happened to El? I have no clue. This movie was submitted and it didn't make the shortlist, even though Isabel Huppert was in the thick of the best actress race. It won the Critics Choice and the Golden Globe. So for it not to be in the shortlist was shocking. Son of Saul won the BAFTA that already won the Oscar. And then we'll just talk about these other movies in our segment of what did not get nominated at the Oscars. The Handmaiden. Why didn't you nominate this? You could have had a freebie here. You could have nominated this in costumes and you didn't even do it. Swiss Army Man, one of my favorites from that year. Sing Street, as mentioned, should have at least gotten song. Everybody Wants Some. This was a really good Richard Linklater movie. I get that it wasn't like an Academy movie maybe because it was kind of just dazed and confused redux. Cresha, movie that I love from Trey Edward Schultz. Another one of my favorites from this year was Don't Think Twice, The Witch. Nominated for nothing, obviously. Patterson, considered one of Jim Jarmusch's best films. And I guess if we're looking for some others, I mean American Honey, Green Room. And that is it for our retrospective. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. What color do you look like in the moonlight?